All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today for this webinar sponsored by the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policies Innovation Policy Lab. I'm Ron Diebert. I'm Professor of Political Science at the Monk School of Global Affairs and in the Department of Political Science. And I'm also the director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School. And today, really excited about this, we're getting together to both celebrate and talk about, I don't know if you can see that, John Lindsay's new book, which I have a, a copy that you can see, I'm thumbing through as we speak, Information Technology and Military Power. We're gonna be inviting questions from the audience please write to us in the Zoom Q&A field in the bottom, and uh, we'll get to as many as those of those questions as we can. So joining us today, first of all, is the author, uh, Professor John Lindsay. He's an assistant professor with the Monk School of Global Affairs and the Department of Political Science. He's also the author of this uh, wonderful book. And in conversation with John is Professor Brian Kentwell-Smith, who's the Reed Hoffman Professor of Artificial Intelligence and the Human at the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. So um, we got a bit of time for John and Brian to have a little bit of a conversation and maybe I'll, I'll uh, pipe in here and there. And then we'll get to uh, questions and answers with all of you. So without further ado, I think it'd be great if turn it over first to John to give us a little background and context for this uh, new book of yours, John, welcome. Great. Thanks very much, Ron. And thanks especially to Stacey Belmer and the event staff uh, at the Monk School for all the hard work pulling this together. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to share the virtual stage here with Ron and Brian. Uh, both have done some pioneering work on the nature of information technology, and both have been mentors for me personally, um, but on opposite sides of this project. Um, I, uh, as an undergraduate at Stanford, took a seminar on the philosophy of computation with uh, Brian, and it really uh, opened my mind to thinking about um, how fundamentally messy and social uh, computers really were. And uh, on the other end, um, Ron has been a, a wonderful friend and colleague uh, who recruited and has, uh, has nurtured me here at the Monk School. So, so it's really fantastic to be here. And in, in some ways, this book does span the philosophy of computation to the politics of cybersecurity, but it sort of takes a strange peregrination in between. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, American combat operations may be a few steps removed from things that Brian and Ron usually focus on. So, uh, so what the heck ties this panel together? Uh, now, the, the book is ostensibly about information technology and military power, as the title suggests. Um, and normally when I talk about this, I talk about uh, cyber operations, artificial intelligence, robotics, battlefield networks, uh, the importance of organizations and strategic context for understanding how these technologies actually work, uh, maybe a little bit about um, the coming or avoiding the coming robot war with China. And a lot of that is in the book. So if you're interested in those things, uh, get the book, read it, um, you'll, you'll find lots to learn about. But wait, that's not all you get. Uh, the, the book is uh, also about some broader themes that, you know, maybe are a little more immediately related to, um, uh, to things that I've learned from both Brian and Ron. Uh, the book is about, you know, what does it mean for human beings to perceive the, and understand the world through layers of technology? And what does it mean for communities of human beings to interfere with and adapt those technologies for, for various regions? Um, now, the military, uh, oddly enough, turns out to be uh, a really useful laboratory for asking some of these general questions. Um, I sometimes think about military organizations as being like the giant axon of the squid, right? So neuroscientists have studied this thing. It's about five inches long and about a millimeter thick. It's a neuron you can see with your naked eye. Um, and it has helped neuroscience learn a ton about how neurons actually work. Well, similarly, the military, if you care about technology, there's a ton of technology there. It's really, really 
complex and ubiquitous. Um, uh, if you think politics matters, uh, war is obviously a hyper-competitive environment, but military organizations themselves are deeply cooperative, right? You have lots of people that are working together, maybe even willing to give their lives for, for a cause. So if you think that conflict and cooperation matter in the technologies that help us to understand the world, uh, military organizations are a great lab to, to sort of poke around and, and look at this. Now, uh, this, this book uh, tries to do a lot of things and speak to uh, a lot of audiences. Uh, perhaps unwisely, it tries to synthesize kind of three uh, very, very uh, different uh, experiences. The first would be uh, my interest, my kind of early interest, dating back to uh, uh, my time with Brian at Stanford, uh, in human-computer interaction, and specifically how knowledge and action work together, how human uh, knowledge is often distributed across the tools that we use. Uh, but then I also spent uh, about a decade uh, in uniform in the United States military, uh, and I served in the Kosovo conflict uh, and later in the Iraq war. And uh, the first one was uh, an air war, right? And so uh, I was personally not at risk. I was living in Italy, personally very comfortably, uh, worked in an office-like environment, working on PowerPoint presentations and Excel uh, folders. Uh, and yet the information that we manipulated had effects that we would then see on CNN, right? And I thought, this is a very different kind of military experience than my father had or that you might see on screen, right? Something very fundamentally different here is happening here. And going back to the kind of computational themes, cognition is not just about what happens in brains or even the interface with computers. Cognition is fundamentally distributed across these incredibly complex organizations. Uh, and in a later experience with the Navy SEAL team in Iraq, uh, I saw more complicated operations and more complicated perceptions and misperceptions built into these organizations. So, uh, so whether you are interested in technology and society, whether you're a national security practitioner, whether you're an international relations scholar interested in military power, uh, hopefully this book has something for you. Um, now, substantively, it tries to do two things. Uh, the first is a negative critique of what I call the technology theory of victory. And um, this is this idea that uh, better technology, more precise weapons, more intelligence, uh, more ubiquitous networks will help militaries to fight and win wars uh, uh, more cheaply, more quickly, more decisively. Uh, narratives about cyber war, kind of the same idea turned on its head, right? The idea that there's these incredible vulnerabilities that uh, clever hackers will be able to exploit. Uh, and this was kind of really, really popular in the 1990s when the dot-com bubble was really uh, taking off and people imagined there was this big transformation of war. Uh, but you can find similar ideas as you know, in the early 20th century, um, you can find Chinese strategists talking about AI and robots in very, very similar terms today. So every generation of technology sort of encourages this enthusiasm. Um, and yet at the same time, the actual experience of war by and large remains confusing, unpredictable, expensive, uh, unsatisfying, frustrating, costly, uh, all, all of these things, right? So there's this kind of perennial mismatch between what we expect the technology to do and what actually happens, right? Um, and the big irony here is that the very technologies that provide intelligence and information that were supposed to lift the fog of war, right, this classic Clausewitzian metaphor for the confusion of combat, right? And there was this idea that technology would lift the fog of war. In fact, it's actually shifted the fog back into organizations. The same organizations that are supposed to reduce uncertainty become new sources of it. Um, so, uh, so there's kind of a, a Buffalo Springfield problem here with IT in the military, right? Something's happening here. What it is isn't too clear. Um, uh, the, the expectations never quite play out, but what's going on? And this reads to kind of the positive aim of the book, which is to really articulate the micro foundations of military power. Uh, and, and, and an easier way of saying this is, is it's an attempt to illuminate what I call information practice. And that's what practitioners do to create, manipulate, process, and communicate uh, information. And if you look inside of any 
modern military organization, you'll see lots and lots of tech uh, and you'll see some precision weapons, uh, but you'll also see lots and lots of representations and diagrams and images and reports and people obsessing over these. And they're looking at them and arguing about them. They're trying to get access to them and negotiate um, who can have access. There's this intensive organizational and social uh, activity in complex organizations to understand the world. Um, now, uh, this increasingly feels very, very similar to what you might see in any large corporation. And so this convergence between military labor and civilian um, office spaces uh, is also very interesting, right? So we're replacing military brawn with uh, intellectual brains, right? Um, you also see service members increasingly using commercial technologies to try and uh, fix things and make adaptations and repairs along the way for better or worse. Um, so you might say that amateurs talk cyber war while professionals debug information systems. That's a ton of what's actually going on. Now, the key argument of the book is that there are these kind of political and economic problems that are at the heart of any technological system. Technology is a lens, but that lens is not just technology. It depends on agreements about how it works and how it's put together. Political and organizational arrangements shape that lens. The more complex the lensing, the more complicated the politics, and there's no way out, right? You cannot get out of the political foundations that make technology work. And the book explores these dynamics in, in a couple of detailed cases. Uh, it looks at terrible mismatches between technology and problems that create uh, friendly fires and fratricide and uh, the bombing of the Chinese embassy in Kosovo, for example. It looks at successful examples where organizations planned well in advance and their adversary was nice enough to give them exactly the problem they planned for. That's the Battle of Britain. It looks at examples of practitioners who in a Silicon Valley startup mode were tinkering with their own uh, technology. They were cobbling together uh, uh, bits of code that they were writing uh, by hook or by crook. Uh, they were actually making some very sophisticated software packages to deal with changing problems. Um, and then I'll look at some old problems where uh, users are doing the same things, but it ends up reinforcing cultural biases of the organization rather than clarifying the world that they are dealing with. So, um, uh, and then the book also kind of talks about maybe some implications for thinking about defense strategy. Uh, maybe in the Q and A, people want to talk about that. But um, uh, just because I want to uh, turn it over to, to, to Brian and Ron uh, quickly, uh, let me just conclude by circling back to where we began with, um, and 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 maybe make the connection to some of Brian's work. Uh, you know, Brian uh, is is amazing at showing us how everything that we take for granted about the technology and mathematics of computing is actually full of some major philosophical and indeed metaphysical uh, assumptions. Um, so this book, right, tries to uh, look at this mess of computation, which I call information friction, and show how that fri friction is ubiquitous and fundamental in getting machines to work and getting machines to represent the world, showing how it is a spur for innovation and also how it also endogenously creates even more friction. Uh, friction is not simply uncertainty, it's also a form of traction that allows information systems and technologies to become more complex and more functional along the way. Now, um, Ron's work shows us how the same technologies that enhance communication and exchange also have this dark side, right? They enable government surveillance and information control in cyberspace. So Ron really kind of highlights the duality of, of hacking and kind of this classic libertarian form or it's supposed to be a form of creativity and freedom through the, the cyberspace, but also hacking is a form of exploitation and subversion, which allows states to stifle dissent and stifle freedom. And we often think about this kind of general tension in kind of big societal terms. There's sort of the libertarian civil society versus authoritarian government. Uh, but the book kind of explores how these same tensions even exist in the most hierarchical organizations. We're used to thinking of the military as the paragon of chains of command and formalized structures. And yet even there, you see this burgeoning of creativity. So uh, this, these tensions and efforts to work through it are really, really fundamental to any kind of information system, whether it be military command and control or electronic medical records. And that probably is the enduring theme of the book, is that the systems that reduce uncertainty become new sources of it. If we want to understand technology, 
we really need to understand society writ large. And those tragic moments in which society is tearing itself apart become a really, really useful lens for, for illuminating all of these phenomena. So I'll stop there and uh, uh, thanks again, everybody for, for coming today. Awesome, thank you so much, John, for that, uh, that opening overview of this excellent book. Uh, Brian, over to you. Sorry, um, I hope you can hear me now. Um, I, uh, I, I've known John a long time as he suggested, um, and um, he's a very disciplined guy and a very productive guy. I went back to his 1994 emails um, to see if um, he said anything incriminating or embarrassing back then. Um, but he was so disciplined at the time that, that he was very, um, he was very um, careful not to put that into email. But I do remember from those interactions, um, both the clarity of his focus, but also the grip of uh, the sort of severity and grip of this idea about information practice and its relationship to military things and so on. And uh, as compared with uh, Xerox Park and the, and the other kinds of people in Silicon Valley at the time where we were, this kind of gravity and severity of interest, I think just really stood out and has always been something I have valued. Um, so it's an enormous pleasure to see it come to fruition in this, in this book. Um, it's, and uh, so I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be here um, and to celebrate with John the first of, of his books. I'm sure there'll be more. Um, and what an amazing book it is. I, I just want to say, to so start with a few things about it that just impressed the hell out of me. Um, and uh, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up some questions in a little bit. One thing about this book is its interdisciplinarity is extremely impressive in a variety of ways. First of all, it's very broad. Um, and not only is it broad, but it's deep. So there's philosophical references, you know, there's Heidegger, Brentano and Quine and Dreyfus and Zahavi and Rorty and so on and so forth. And, you know, these are all people I've read. And, um, and then in Cogsci, there's Hutchins and Sterling and David Kirsch and Andy Clark and a variety of other people. And STS, Science Technology Studies, you know, there's work of Lucy Suchman, Langdon Winter, John Law, Bruno Latour, and so on and so forth. And, and just other pieces in the intellectual firmament, um, complexity theory, self-organization, references to grounded theory and sociology, dealing with Gibsonian affordances, and so on and so forth. Now, the thing is not that John just refers to these things. What I find impressive is he's very sensitive to their sensibilities, at least sensitive to what I think is right about those sensibilities. I mean, rarely have I actually felt that somebody could refer to and use all of these literatures with the sensitivity and get what's what's get what's on about what these people are on about in a way that actually is relevant. Um, so that's an enormous achievement. Um, um, and it's um, it's one of these things which is relaxing in the sense that you wish everything else was like this. Uh, it's just like such a relief to read something that I think understands its background literatures in all these different ways. Um, there's something else about the book, which is a very striking, and this will get to how it is that the book is more general than, than being about military things. But this thing that impressed me about John at the beginning of the sort of gravity and grounding in the realities of war is, is really riveting. And it's, it brings a seriousness that is often lacking in discussions of information practice. One thing in particular, one of the pet peeves of mine is that a lot of discussions about information systems, about computing and AI and stuff are framed as if they're talking about the world and, and ethics and so on and so forth. But actually they're just about the insides of these systems. So discussions, for example, that have been going on at the uh, schwartz Reisman Center, um, you know, about the ethics of AI, but the ethics of AI turns out to be the relationship between the sentences that come out of these models and the occurrence of a number of predicates like um, that are deemed prejudicial or sexist or colonialist or, 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 or whatever it is. Um, so, so even the words are used about like sexism and ethics and fairness and so on and so forth. They're sort of system internal kinds of deliberations. John never succumbs to that problem. And I think the, the, the seriousness of the, of the war and people getting killed and actual operations on the ground and things being blown up and so on and so forth, 
I mean, not to, not to be melodramatic about it, but it provides a kind of grounding in the world, which again, I think is extremely important and extremely missing in so much of today's discussions about AI and commuting systems, um, even about the representation. So this is a book about the nature of representation in some ways, about its practice, its use, its its merits and demerits, its foils and, 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 and powers and stuff. Um, one of the things that John does very well is he recognizes the sort of in, inevitable tension and kind of dialectic and movement between the generality of abstractions, which simplify or partly constructed and so on and so forth, which are necessary for, for, for generality, for communication and so on and so forth. And then the particularities of actually engaging in concrete situations and how the abstractions, you know, we talk about abstraction, we don't talk about concretization. But, but but those sort of go hand in hand where you actually have to let go of the abstract and go back to the concrete. Um, John is fabulous on that, and but not just fabulous, he grounds that in this being in the world of a sort that, that is so admirable. So he talks about referential integrity, the coordination of representations. Here's just a little quote. He talks about um, these systems that that are getting used as complicated systems of pointers, identifiers, model records, representational states and stuff that are constantly risk, constant at constant risk of falling out of sync as the runtime circumstances change and so on. And that falling out of sync means they just lose their grip on the world. Um, so that's impressive. Um, something else is impressive is um, the balance. He's not ideological about any of these things. So you know, there are constructivists who think everything is socially constructed and, and sort of disrealists. Um, there are, there's lots of sort of left-wing ideology in contemporary intellectual theorizing, I think maybe especially in humanities and social sciences in the last 10, 20 years. Um, and, um, you know, I'm not a fan of, of uh, fundamentalism on the left anymore than I'm a fan of fundamentalism on the right. And I think John's book is, is exemplary in recognizing what matters about constructivism, recognizing what matters about um, socio-technical practices, recognizing how non-absolute representations are and so on and so forth without ever being ideological. And I think one thing that gives John, I mean, it's probably just a property of John, but I mean, one thing that helps that is his anchoring in these very serious concrete situations in the world. Um, and so, so those are, I mean, those are in a way sort of formal properties of the work, but, but they absolutely recommend it. And um, I just can't overemphasize how, how rare that non-ideological, thoroughly informed balance is across these methods, methods and methodologies. Um, he then comes up with a framework of information practice where he talks about a matrix of types of organization and types of problem and how they fit and don't fit and so on and so forth, um, which is really, uh, I mean, it's too simple and John knows it's too simple and, 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 you know, that's part of the point is to simplify it enough that it's imaginatively accessible. Um, but then he talks about how sort of managed kind of organizational practice, information practice, um, when you've got an institutionalized um, organization that is pretty well sort of structured and you've got a constrained situation that it's dealing with, that tends to work pretty well. And if you have a sort of adaptive organic kind of organization, that's more like, you know, Silicon Valley startup mentality or something and bricolage and rhizomatic invention and so on and so forth, that's more likely to work better in an unstable and constantly shifting and disorganized problem domain. Um, and you can see cases of both of those working and then cases where the it doesn't fit, where there's a mismatch between the problem and the solution, um, where you have, um, you know, organic as he calls them uh, forms of um, organization, which are, you know, more the bricolage rhizomatic stuff, but um, dealing with constrained problems, which are stable and overall, you know, that can lead to sort of accents, errors, instability, non-coordination and all that kind of stuff. Um, or something that I think at least I've encountered more, which is you get an institutionalized structure with an unconstrained problem so that the world is changing and it's more rich and variegated and so on and so forth. 
but the organization gets up with a kind of ideological grip on its own way of being and sees the entire world through that way of being. And that's also going to be blinkered and lead to misperception and so on. And so it's part of the book is a story of those kinds of organizations and also really interesting point about how organizations tend to cycle through them all. I don't want to take time here, except I just want to mention that the cases, one about the Battle, Battle of Britain and uh, Afghanistan and this uh, mapping system called Falcon View, um, something about Iraq. Uh, the, the Iraq chapter, it's horrifyingly believable. Um, it just should be read by anybody building a complex information system, um, dealing with the chaos lurking behind the PowerPoint slides. I mean, it's just, it just, it's really sort of jaw dropping um, how rich and powerful the failure of the mythology is and so on and so forth. I'd like to assign it to every um, chief engineer in Silicon Valley. Um, um, he also punctures a lot of simple ideological myths about some of these things like drones. There's a lot of discussion about how drones remove the people doing it from the damage and stuff, but there's actually accounts, including a first person account of how killing was more difficult in a predator than in fact flying a bomber over the site because the, the, the richness of the experiential encounter and the immediacy, even though the guy pilot sitting in God knows where, Tucson or something like this, the, the experiential immediacy is actually greater than when flying the, the bomber. And so that actually made it harder and so on and so forth. So just there's realism here that comes from this concrete grounding and so on. Um, so just admirable. That's really what I think this book is. It's really admirable. Um, I also want to say, I guess I've said it already, but I hope people read this book who are not actually themselves focused on the issue of military power and, and war and stuff. Because the lessons that John extracts, as he said in his introduction, this is a, a, a exemplary case of information practice with a big complicated organization dealing with a big complicated information system, dealing with a big complicated world and how we come to understand it and so on and so forth. People dealing with healthcare, people dealing with financial systems, people dealing with God knows vaccine distributions and stuff. I mean, these, I think these types of situation, these types of mismatch and so on and so forth that Jen brings up, um, they really would be invaluable to people developing information practices in general. Um, here are two questions I'm gonna throw up and then I'm gonna stop with this. Um, one thing that's really interesting because I was thinking about 1994 um, when, um, you know, because that's when I looked for your emails and stuff. Um, and, um, you know, I was thinking about AI. I, I'm old enough that I was around when AI sort of started back 127 years ago um, and the, the myth at the time was that this was going to replace thinking. It was not a data science at the time. It was that you know, these systems were going to themselves make decisions, were going to themselves come to decisions, themselves um, have judgments about the world and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, a little, a little book I wrote last year, it's just, it's just a travel brochure basically, but about judgment. It's sort of like AI is nowhere near building computer systems that themselves can make judgments about the situations we're in. This is, John's book is an admirable account of our use of these systems to deal with real world problems. But it also is sort of in the background, a kind of testament to how far we are. People talk about artificial general intelligence and so on and so forth, but how far we are from in fact building systems that can actually shoulder this kind of decision and actually take responsibility for anything they do, they, they do. So I'm just, I'd be curious, John, if you have views about that, of how, how you put a stake in the ground <laughs> oh, for what it is that the people who are AI triumphalists think they're close to, but are actually a gazillion miles away from. Um, and then what the final question is just, it's just been on my mind the last while while I've read this book. We had a master's student at the iSchool who wrote a master's thesis and I believe this is its title, Violence as an Information Practice. Not the use of information in 
perpetrating violence, or not that information use was in fact violence, but that violence itself was a form of information practice used to establish regimes of representation, used to do this and so on and so forth. John's book is interesting. It doesn't talk, up, it's about military power and war, about the contact of war, but it's lyrically quiet. It's really quite interesting. <laughs> It's very powerful in how it doesn't bring up at all the issue of the nature of war and what the war is for and so on and so forth. It's just there, it's just there. Um, I'd be curious your thoughts, John, on the, the information practice that, that actually is the conduct of war itself. Um, what it's for, what its intentionality is, what it's trying to do, um, whether in fact the war itself, in fact, has failed because of having, you know, falling into these forms of information practice and so on and so forth. So, um, so war is an information practice rather than information practice in support of war. It just, it just seems to me a sort of haunting idea that I would love to read a book by one John R. Lindsay about at some point in the future. Um, so some thoughts. Awesome, thank you so much, Brian. Um, so John, we have uh, some other questions from the audience queued up, but I thought you might wanna have a reaction to uh, to Brian's comments first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brian, <laughs> thank you so much for, for taking the time to read this and, and your, your incredibly generous comments. Um, you know, I, I, I it was very, very gratifying to, to hear them because I felt that you were kind of seeing what I was trying to do, which in some ways I kind of had to obfuscate, right? You can almost use the book's framework to interpret the coming to being of the book itself, right? So uh, it's going to talk about these kind of fundamental issues about uh, about knowledge, the messiness of knowledge, um, the kind of horrors beneath the myth. Um, and most of the attempts to do that have happened in this STS vernacular, um, which uh, not only is not accessible, it, it can be very off-putting to some people that are in practical realms. And I think we see this in the IT world and the cyber world and certainly in, in the military world. So, so how do you talk about Heidegger and Brentano and Ed Hutchins, right? Uh, with and you know, and let people know that that's what this book is about, kind of this fraught, politicized, consequential construction of knowledge, and yet still prove to practitioners and national security professionals that not only is talking about the same thing, um, but that you actually value what they were doing, right? So, so I'm always trying to kind of walk this narrow path. Plus, you know, I mean, like. I'm I'm in a political science discipline, right? So I mean, this kind of came out of uh, out of that world. So so I think that there was this, you know, you could say that I was in a very unconstrained environment, but trying to write a formal book, right? Which was almost by my own theory uh, guaranteed to fall into one of these boxes where you know the solution is mismatched uh, against against the problem. So um, you know I. Uh, I, I fought against that for a long time, but then I kind of just embraced that tension as sort of a generative mechanism for, for trying to, to surface some of these ideas. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's just so interesting kind of talking about this with different audiences that, you know, we'll kind of focus on, on different things, but um, you know, uh, uh, I, I could have written an entire book about these things, but I think I would have lost, um, you know, a, a ton of the audience. Um, uh, great question, you know, how we think about uh, AI. Um, you know, I've been having a, a great set of conversations with a colleague over in the Rotman School, uh, Avi Goldfarb. Uh, and in fact, we've kind of written up a, a few little things uh, about just this issue, right? And, you know, in a nutshell, right, uh, while AI may have advanced a little bit since the GoFi days when you had to kind of manually code everything in there, um, you still kind of have to provide enough scaffolding and have enough idea what you want the system to do or to reckon in your terms. Um, but figuring out why you want it to do something and what its answers are valuable for, right? Um, that's ultimately uh, literally a judgment call. And judgment is about 
making meaning. It's about arguing. It's about these intersubjective uh, interactions. And you know, I don't think it's impossible in principle for you know machines to get there. I mean, I think that you know whatever we are, it's some kind of hierarchical Bayesian embodied thing. And so you know, maybe if the feedbacks were dense enough and the bodies were tight enough with the AI, you know, you could get there. But right now, right, they're still very much in this insular world. And so um, uh, our, our thought about this was, well, when you think about kind of this variation across problems, there are some problems that look a lot more like civilian logistics or administration that Amazon and FedEx have made some progress using AI to solve. Well, to the sense that there are military analogs to some of those problems, AI might be really, really helpful. But then you kind of get deep down the Clausewitzian rabbit hole where like, everything is falling apart and it's confusing and you know you've got all this stress and suffering and danger around you right and Clausewitz falls back on this kind of very romantic notion which he calls genius and it's a very 19th century kind of concept but the idea is like you have to kind of have this coup de oil that sees through the fog of war right and Right now, we, <laughs> there is no way to, to program that um, with, with the existing AI technology. So, so I think that you know that kind of points to there are some tasks that are going to be purely human tasks, but then there's all these interesting things in the middle where kind of human machine teaming is going to be a possibility. But that's just going to then generate more and more complexity because every attempt to solve friction creates new friction, precisely because if you can do more you know, uh, then there are more, not just are there more ways to break things, right? There are more ways for adversaries to start to intervene. And this, this actually, I didn't see this before, but this leads really nicely into your second question. Um, you're right that I kind of intentionally kind of kept this at a low level rather than going where, where my field usually goes, which is kind of these questions of what's the strategic aim and the civil political authority match what civil society wants or thinks it wants? Uh, is there an alignment with civil military relations? Uh, does the strategy match? The and these are all good and important questions, but I would wager that if you spend some time at the National Security Council in Washington, DC or anywhere else that strategy is notionally made, it's probably sadly going to look a lot like the Ambar province case, right? And you're going to see um, people doing very, very weighty things, but kind of reliant on some almost simplistic representations of the world. And, and you kind of look at that and you're like, my God, like, like ignorance almost seems to be a condition for the possibility of these large systems actually doing anything and, and getting anything done. And that ties interestingly into kind of some of our, our key theories of war, which are which are really looking at the role of uncertainty, right? So I mean, a lot of formal models of war that look at it as a bargaining problem, see uncertainty as a condition for the possibility of war. And this suggests that wars are going to take place precisely on the margins of what you're able to do well. So whatever you solve with your military information systems, you are setting the conditions for where that war is actually going to take place. And it's not going to be the Battle of Britain. Like that is, that's this weird exception that proves the rule where like the Brits prepare for 20 years to do exactly what they do in 1940. And the Germans do exactly what, what the British trained for. I mean, it's, it's just, it's remarkable. That, that hardly ever happens. 1991 Gulf War would be another example, but like usually this, this is not the case. So, um, so yeah, yeah. I think that, um, I, you know, I intend this to be kind of a general sort of scale-free concept, but I think we'd find that it's it's mess all the way up or turtles all the way down, however you want to put that. But but thank you, thank you so much, Brian. This was just 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 wonderful and uh, you know really really gratifying to to feel like the message got through. Great. Okay, so there are a couple of questions I want to get to in the queue, starting with Rose Dyson, who says this is a fascinating topic. Looks forward to reading. Um, the book and it has a question about uh, you clearly caution against too much faith in technology to solve social and political problems, but more specifically, do you say anything about the long standing military industrial entertainment complex. Yeah. I think that's a, a James Derderian concept if I'm not mistaken, our cultural environment is rife with war stories heroism and violence generally a conflict resolution strategy. So <clears throat> anything about that, John? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, so 
I don't say, I don't use that language in particular, but I absolutely address it. In the Iraq chapter that, that Brian was talking about, you know, um, when I when I went into that case, uh, and again, lots of weird historical particularity, I was in the Naval Reserves while I was in grad school, you know, got, was clear I was going to get mobilized. And so, you know, I was able to talk to all the right people and kind of use this as a, as, as, as field work, okay, if you will. And, um, so I, I expected to find the mess and I expected to find representations breaking down. I expected to find people debugging for the better will. What I was surprised by was how intense Navy SEAL culture was and how it fundamentally shaped everything the organization did. And not just what Navy SEALs did, but, you know, because, you know, it's kind of like a football team, right? You've got kind of like, you know, all of these like, buff gladiators and then you've got all these people in the stands you know behind the scenes making it happen and so special operations task force is kind of the same thing and everybody kind of harmonizes into this sort of hyper masculine environment that is kind of navy seal land now um, there are places where maybe that's uh, appropriate but i would argue in this case and this is iraq in uh, 2007 2008 um, this is uh, right before the u.s troops surge there's this thing called the ambar awakening where uh, the local uh, sunni population makes um, a calculation that uh, while they were partnered with al-qaeda now they're going to uh, fight against Al Qaeda because it's clear the U.S. is about to leave, and when they leave, the Shia population that now is in charge in Baghdad is going to leave them high and dry. So they might as well take advantage of American firepower while it's still available. So there's this terrible civil war in 2006, 2007, kind of burns itself out. So by the time I'm there, the mission is to try and help transition these militias out of this vigilante role back into normal civil society, try and rebuild ANBAR. Um, and there's sort of, you know, uh, this residual counterterrorism uh, problem. So, uh, you know, for counterinsurgency, winning hearts and minds, development, all that stuff, you know, uh, good or bad idea, like that's the mission. But you take an organization that is very much focused on exactly what you would expect Navy SEALs to be focused on. And this is where your entertainment complex comes from, right? Because the SEALs eat their own dog food, okay? Uh, they write their own hagiographic hey, war stories. They get made into movies by Clint Eastwood and other folks, right? And so everybody knows that the Navy SEALs killed Osama bin Laden. They saved Captain Phillips, right? And so like there is this heroic narrative that's written into what people expect to do on their deployment. And so I tried to document like the ways that like every mundane step of the way, right? Uh, information processes were kind of grooved into reproducing this cultural identity, which I think was really mismatched for the political reality of, of AMBAR uh, at the time. So, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, and, 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 and maybe there's an argument to be made that because war is safer for one side, it's fun, you know, like the killing is radically asymmetric, right? So I mean, like the costs are totally borne by the civilian population and the targets of U.S. military power. But for, for U.S. military personnel, like war has never been so physically safe, right? I mean, you lose more soldiers to auto accidents back in the continental United States than you do in combat, okay? So um, given that you've got that, um, it, it might be a situation in which that allows an indulgence of of kind of these cultural archetypes um, because you're not getting the same selection feedback from, from the environment. Hmm. Cool. Um, Robin Bigger has a question. And actually this uh, kind of merves with a question that I was going to ask John and, and maybe a comment as well. He's wondering about, he saw HBO's QAnon into the storm, basically about QAnon, the movement. And <clears throat> he was wondering what you think about how one person can have such an impact on social behavior and ideological violence through very simple tech, just by having broad reach. <clears throat> and what I was gonna ask, kind of related, I, I, I wrote a paper a while back or co-authored a paper about uh, the Russian-Georgian conflict and, and the cyber component of that, if you will, and came up with this uh, concept of cyclones in cyberspace, and in part to get at this idea of contingency that things could happen in unpredictable ways but also to get at the kind of piling on from the outside. And I'm wondering, do you think I, I, your, your focus in, in this book is on information practices, on practitioners, 
But I'm, I'm hoping you could take a step back and think about broader system structural changes that might be going on around ICTs and in particular around this idea of individuals or even civilians. Maybe civilians in armed conflict have, you know, the, the, their role has evolved over time as, you know, just absent, maybe spectators to being casualties. But now are we at a point where they can actually intervene meaningfully because of ICTs in ways that disrupt armed, armed conflict that we have? And, and is that bringing about a, a change in, in the nature of warfare altogether? Yeah, um, that, that, that's, a, that's a terrific question. And, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, there's this myth of kind of the omnipotent hacker individual that can, you know, change the world, right? So Mr. Robot is built on this whole premise, right? Um, and, and, and that is surely overblown, right? So, I mean, if, if anything, like the focus is on the importance of context and organization and societies, right? I mean, like, um, you know, you mentioned this kind of, you know, QAnon, you know, January 6th event, right? I mean, like, that's all about kind of large scale social movements rather than any one particular individual. Well, maybe one particular individual, but, um, uh, but at the same time, you're, you're right, right? I mean, in the, the book has all of these examples where, you know, there are one or a handful of individuals that you know, are like, let's come up with a different way to do this, right? Um, a lot of kind of the infrastructure for drones, if you, the picture that you always see on the news with like two guys sitting in the van and like 16 screens, right? I mean, like, it was just it was a dozen people that are like, wouldn't it be cool if we had a screen here? Wouldn't it be cool if we had this? Well, wouldn't it be cool if we had this app? And they kind of cobbled it together. And then eventually they sold it to the military industrial entertainment and, and complex that, you know, built the same thing for billions of dollars. But, you know, like it was a few individuals that did that, right? Or in the book, right? It was a it was somebody in the Air National Guard that wasn't going to get the big system. So decided to write it himself and like, carried the floppy disk around in his cockpit and like gave it to his other pilot friends. Okay. So like, yeah, there's this sense in which individuals make a difference. And, you know, this is kind of like my, my wager to anybody that goes and spends some time in the field or hangs out in a military organization. Like, look, I think you're going to find the kid with, you know, the access database or the iPhone app that he's written or something like that ends up being really, really key for what that unit is doing. Like, I think that this is so, so ubiquitous. So like battlefield expedient innovation has always been a part of war, but like you, you have this leverage. And, and Ron, you know, you're pointing to, to, to places that that's happening kind of at, on a world historical scale. Um, I think some of the work that you've done in Citizen Lab with, you know, um, uh, with, with John Relton's work on Libya, right? Where you have people kind of cobbling together these amazing kind of distributed internet and intelligence warning systems so that kind of, uh, you know, people around the world were giving like hewing and warning to, you know, uh, activists and rebels on the ground. I mean, so, so yeah, there's, there's, I think some, some really interesting things going on, going on there. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, and by the way, Brian, if you want to jump in at any point, just uh, uh, do so. I'm, I'm just going through our queue of questions. Um, here's another from Thomas Bruce, uh, who uh, is very curious if, John, you have a view of the Vietnam and Afghan-Iraq wars as discrediting the efficacy of military technology and winning wars in the public mind, but as actually contributing to long-run developments whose importance might not be understood until well after the conflicts themselves. This was his own impression after being deployed um, with the R RCN, Arabian Gulf in 2003, and Thomas is a PhD student in our department. All right, uh, well, well, Thomas, let's definitely talk in the fall when we're hopefully able to, to sit down and chat. If we're doing a normal book launch, mm -hmm. like we would all, you know, have a drink or a cup of tea afterwards and, and discuss this. So I would love to hear some more uh, about your experience there. Um, one of the things that's just so surprising to me, kind of looking at the history of technological enthusiasm is like how incredibly cyclic it is, right? I mean, you have um, uh, General William Westmoreland, right, who kind of, you know, oversees this kind of debacle of kind of the buildup in Vietnam and the attempt to instrument the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and it just totally doesn't work, you know, and then he comes back and he's the chief of staff of the army, and he's talking about like, in 10 years, I'm going to have precision weapons and war is going to be fast and easy, and it was like, dude, like, what did you just do, right, um, and then you know, it happens right before the Iraq war, right? You have this Admiral Bill Owens and he's like, 
we have technology and three-dimensional you know things and and we'll have a space that's as big as a rack that you can you know see and and act clearly and that's like three years before the invasion of iraq and you know like the u.s military is still there so so yeah like it's it's amazing how cyclic these expectations are and i think it does tend to discount the costs and then perhaps make 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 the decision for war more available so our colleague from SFU, Paul Meyer, always thinking about uh, international governance is asking whether you see any prospect for negotiating constraints on the military applications of Infotech at the international level. I know there is a, uh, well, there was anyway, a movement around regulating drones yeah. and un unmanned uh, aerial vehicles in particular and robotics around some of that. What's your sense? Uh, John overall and, and Brian please chime in here on on you know restraints around some of this tech yeah you, you know what I'm, I'm actually going to punt to Brian on this because I know that um, your time in the Bay Area with kind of computer professionals or social responsibility and kind of thinking about Star Wars and some of the complexities there might highlight how these issues kind of again are, are evergreen um, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot but I know that this is something oh, you thought about a lot it's actually interesting because uh, to caricature a little bit, one of the things your book says is, look, it, it's not the technology, it's the whole information practice, you know? And, um, and so then we think, well, look, could there be a strategy about the technology? And it's like, I mean, a, 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 a treaty or something like that. And it's, I think it's gonna be really tough. Um, because the problem is naming and identifying a socio-technical practice and saying that's illegal is gonna be pretty hard to implement um, license and so on and so forth. And one thing that's really interesting, okay, so here's, a, here's an anecdote. Back before I knew you, 10 years before I knew you even in Sanford, so in the early 80s, when we started CPSR, CPSR was Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility, we named ourselves that after the physicians for social responsibility, but we were um, incited as it were by the Reagan Star Wars um, anti-ballistic missile system stuff. Um, and we said, look, you know, you can't trust these systems um, with human lives and so on and so on. And we actually went to Livermore and I was this, you know, I was this green, I don't know about green haired, I was this green long haired, you know, ex hippie kid in Silicon Valley and we went to Livermore and we talked to these generals there and they said, oh my God, finally, some computer scientists who aren't complete naive triumphalists about technology, right? We've been running technology for like a few thousand years. We've run ships and so on and so forth. We know it's not, you know, it's not the technology and stuff. And it was quite interesting because the depth of the military's understanding of, of processes, right? And also, as you say, that military command is not this top-down hierarchical thing like an algorithm in a you know Fortran course. Um, it was really very interesting. Um, and actually there were very serious military people in Livermore who were terrified that Reagan actually was going to use this thing, was going to use nuclear weapons. And they sort of were worried that Reagan didn't understand deterrent. I mean he didn't understand that these things were never meant to be used, even though their full-time job was building them and so on and so forth. So you know, it's all very well to say, look, we're not going to have warheads of more than a certain number of megatons and stuff. I don't know how you're going to have a treaty about the complexities of the sort of information practice that you describe. I mean, suppose you said, um, look, no kill decision should be made without human involvement. So then you say, okay, we're going to radio this thing back to Tucson and there's going to be a 18 year old soldier who hasn't slept in three days and stuff and they're sitting in this chair in the middle of the night and they say if the red light goes on push this button and if the green light goes on push this button you know that's not exactly getting human judgment into the stuff into the but but if you if you naively wrote a treaty that in fact human judgment should be involved it might satisfy the criteria and so on so this is tough stuff this is tough stuff to to do by treaty. Um, 
I think issues of ethics and responsibility, like, look, the machine can't be responsible and therefore, you know, we're gonna see this in driverless cars. Regimes of accountability and trust may actually be such that you can deflect responsibility <clears throat> And then, in fact, use um, people's intuitions about that and so on. But tough, tough, tough to get. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so much of the book kind of on the IT focuses on kind of the civil military convergence that I mentioned before, right? So military practice now looks a lot like office practice. Uh, people are using civilian technologies. So, you know, the SEALs built their counterterrorism panopticon out of PowerPoint and Microsoft Word. So are you gonna ban Microsoft Office, right? right. Probably not, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of these other units end up using Microsoft products because they don't have access to other things. So, you know, it, when there's a will, there's a way. So the question is like, well, why do you do that? And then, and then, you know, there are these other issues you can take drones, right? Which we feel like, oh my gosh, it's unaccountable power. And it certainly has that potential in some hands. But it also is more potential for accountability than has ever existed anywhere in war ever, right? Because, you know, you have not just some kid in a van pulling the trigger, you actually have all these commanders and all these analysts and all these lawyers that are on the same circuit watching the same thing and they can review everything, right? So, you know, in a sense, like the more legalized this regime gets, the more salient information practice gets, the more salient, you know, acts of judgment become. So it's another way in which like law might seem like an interesting answer, but law at the end of the day is just another information technology, right? Another information technology that helps to standardize and regulate human behavior, which is still going to put us on this kind of political economic tail chase that we're going to be on. So, um, you know, uh, the good news might be, okay, you know, war is more legalized and regulated, so maybe its intensity is, is under control, but the, the bad side is, like, that just gives it more ways to express itself. Mm. So a couple more questions here, uh, and they're kind of related, I think, in some ways. One is about <clears throat> the belief that technology will bring about the end of war, kind of like Fukuyama's end of history. Um, is there a parallel tradition that mourns a lost age of pure warfare, an institution or soldier who wishes for warfare that's distinct and separate from technology? <clears throat> and then another question from Nathan Sears about the myth that increasingly advanced technologies will contribute to decreasing fog of war and increasing military effectiveness. What, what accounts for that myth, uh, John, that I, you, know, you obviously puncture very well in this book um but uh the book is full of accidents and contingencies yeah. and so forth um how do you explain the persistence of that myth and what about the prior uh claim that you often hear that you know with technology and increased transparency and so we're getting to a point where and i guess you could add into it increasing destructiveness and lethality and pre precision combined with interdependence war becoming obsolete. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, super complex questions right right at the end here. Um, <laughs> uh, I, th I think what's, you know, one of kind of the big macro trends that we see is that like, you know, you don't see big, huge wars between states. Okay, you see states intervening in faraway places, you see non state actors going at it, you see civil wars, right? So there's sort of this downward pressure on the severity of war, but then there is this outward proliferation and creativity, for lack of a better word, on the way that you know conflict expresses itself. So to the degree that everybody's talking about gray zone conflict between peace and war, irregular, asymmetric, you know, cyber conflict, right? These are all kind of forms of war that are simultaneously a result of greater control, but also kind of a loss of control at this different um, uh, layer. So, so I guess I would kind of want to, to hear both of those um, you know, at the same time and in, in the same register. Um, there was there was another part of your question at the beginning that. But there's about the decreasing fog of war. Like, why is that? Why why do we oh, always? Why did why, why do people? Okay, so yeah, so I I think it's because my my criticism is conditional, right? Sometimes, like, there are things that work 
right? There are problems that can be solved, right? Seductively so, right? Um, you know, um, when you read kind of military professional journals, um, you know, the, the Air Force and the Navy, is, they're always more bullish on technology for obvious reasons, and the Marines and the Army who are in the mud, right, are a little more skeptical. But even those guys, when you read their after action reports, they're like, our technology sucked, it didn't work. Next time we need a system that will do this, right? Because now that they've gone through this and kind of the crush and the mangle of practice have helped them to clarify their needs, now they can specify the requirements, right? So there's this, this tantalizing solvability, right? Like, like, again, like war is not complete random chaos and noise, right? That it wouldn't happen, right? It's on the edge of order, the edge of chaos, right? And so it's, it's controllable enough. It's seductively available. Uh, you know, and, and technologists always think this way, okay? So like you're solving a problem today as we understand it. And even if you are trying to solve the meta problem of like, let's build solvability into it, right? It's still kind of along the parameters that, that you've gone to. So, so I think there's some sense that like, like, like there's a ton of stuff that militaries used to do that they just don't do anymore, right? We've outsourced a lot of the active, you know, operational things that people used to do to, to machines, okay? You used to need divisions to control something that a special operations platoon can do today because they've got satellites and drones and all of this other stuff. So like, like these tactical problems are solvable, but that means the strategic problem is out of control. Thank you. Brian, also, any final words? Yeah, I just want to add a footnote to that. I think one of the seductions of technology is that technologies are often built on a certain ontological parse of the world. And then people think that the world is that ontological parse. Yes. If there was that ontological parse, then it might be neat. But of course, that's one of the things about representation that everybody who studies representation seriously, and this book too, says is look, the world is stupefying richer and more complicated and less predictable and so on and so forth than these abstractions in terms of which we build these technologies. And I would recommend anybody who thinks that technology is going to remove the fog of war, read chapter five of John's book and then come back with an argument. Um, I agree. Uh, so listen, thank you, uh, first of all, Brian, for your, your comments and participating in this panel. It's great to see you again. And, and here, um, you're always interesting views on, on these type of topics. And I, I couldn't agree more uh, with your characterization of, of uh, John and this book. And, and I'll say this, you know, I've read lots of John's stuff. I'm deep into this book. Um, he has this amazing ability to, to write economically, but within each sentence, is, it's, if, it's as if there's compressed within each sentence reference to huge bodies of scholarship. So you're going through this and you're like, wow, how does he get all this in here? It's, it's phenomenal. And yet it's also so well written. And the fact that John knows what he's talking about, he's not, not somebody who's just, you know, eavesdropping or, or looking at something from afar. He's got firsthand experience. So the, the rich ethnography going on here is really cool and well worth it. And, and uh, I will say this, the opening sequence about the um, the bombing of the Chinese embassy is fantastic. It sets up the whole book, right? Like that's that's what it's all about. These um, these accidents and things going wrong and technology intervening in between us and the world that we're trying to navigate. Um, so, John, uh, congratulations on this book. Uh, you really um, knocked it out of the park, and look forward to what you have next. And thanks, everybody. Uh, for dropping in and for your questions. I think we got to most of them. If we didn't, I apologize. We could have gone on for another hour. And lastly, uh, thanks to uh, everybody at the Monk School uh, for helping out and, and putting this on. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, Stacy and Adam, thank you for having our backs. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Thanks.